So at its core, filmmaking is a feat of both collaboration and compromise, of hundreds of artists pooling their talents to produce art under a set series of constraints. But some of the requests that had to be met in order to get films off the ground were pretty mad. So let's take a look at them as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 insane rules movies weren't allowed to break. Number 10. Blofeld couldn't be named on screen or have his face shown. For your eyes only. 1981's Roger Moore starring Bond film For Your Eyes Only kicks off with a pre-titled sequence in which 007 dispatches a bald-headed, wheelchair-bound white cat owning antagonist by dropping him down a bloody chimney. The villain is credited as <clears throat> bald-headed man with white cat, yet obviously bears an uncanny resemblance to iconic Bond baddie Ernst Stavro Blofeld. However, due to an ongoing legal dispute between Thunderball producer Kevin McClory and Eon Productions over the rights to Thunderball and by extension Blofeld, he could only be included in the film as a Blofeld adjacent facsimile. Even though it's hilariously obvious to any fan watching that this is a Blofeld stand-in, the production had to ensure not to show the character's face or mention him by name for fear of triggering a massive lawsuit from McClory. And so, that pre-title sequence is infamous for its awkward not-depiction of the character, which is made all the more bizarre given that there wasn't really any urgent need to put him in the movie at all. Number 9. No direct references to the MCU – Deadpool Though Deadpool is of course a Marvel character, it's only recently that he's been included under the Marvel Studios banner, following Disney's acquisition of 20th Century Fox, but when the first Deadpool movie was released back in 2016, it was a Fox property entirely unrelated to the MCU, and so couldn't in any direct way interact with aspects of that franchise. As a result, director Tim Miller had to be extremely careful with how he staged the film's finale between Deadpool and Ajax, which appears to take place on a S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier. But because a Fox Marvel movie couldn't legally include assets or designs owned by Marvel, during production the concept artist was ordered to ensure the totally not a heli carrier wasn't an exact replica of the MCU's own version. And for his part as well, director Tim Miller offered up his own denial that it was intended to be a shield heli carrier, but now that Disney owns Fox, I think it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Number 8. The words Mafia and Cosa Nostra couldn't appear in the script. The Godfather the Godfather is of course one of the greatest movies ever made, yet despite focusing intimately on the internal machinations of the Mafia, that word is never actually spoken even once throughout its epic 177 minute runtime. While the novel did use the word, the film was produced under the mandate that neither Mafia nor Cosa Nostra could ever be said, at the behest of the mobster known as Joseph Colombo, who complained that the script emphasized Italian-American stereotypes. Fearful that Colombo could use his powerful mob connections to sabotage the production, the team removed a couple of mentions of both terms from the script. This not only ensured that shooting went smoothly, but led the Italian-American Civil Rights League, which Columbo had founded, to ultimately support the script. The two Godfather sequels, however, did include a few scattered spoken mentions of both terms. Number 7. The Villain Couldn't Use an iPhone – Knives Out Rian Johnson is just one of many filmmakers who's had to deal with this restriction, but he is definitely the director who's been most vocal about it in recent years. Now, product placement is simply a foregone aspect of the movie business, because if a character needs a phone for a scene, why not get Apple to provide the phones and maybe even pay to have their brand in the film, right? Though Apple did indeed provide iPhones for Johnson's brilliant murder mystery Knives Out, it did come with a strict caveat that the phones not be used by any villainous characters on screen. Like most major companies, Apple are extremely, one could argue, pathetically protective over how their brand is portrayed, and were seemingly fearful that having a murderer use an iPhone could create an unsavory connection in audiences' minds. Tellingly, then, most of Knives Out suspects can be seen using an iPhone at one time or another, except for Ransom, who of course turns out to be the killer. Johnson was reluctant to reveal this deal, as he's effectively given away the game for not only his fellow filmmakers, but for himself, what with Knives Out 2 due to release later this year. Basically, if you see any character in a movie using an iPhone, they're not going to be the bad guy. Number 6. Hal Jordan had to have a fully CGI lantern suit – Green Lantern now, Green Lantern was one of the most infamous superhero duds of the 2010s, and though neither its script nor its direction were particularly good, perhaps the biggest complaint amongst critics and fans was the ill-advised decision to give Hal Jordan a fully CGI lantern suit. This allegedly wasn't a decision made by the director, but from Warner Brothers themselves. Warner Brothers wanted to ensure that the suit would be a manifestation of Hal Jordan's power, and so felt that the only way to achieve this was to have it be a digital object which could be mapped onto him however they saw fit. As a result, Reynolds simply wore a motion capture suit during shooting and the digital lantern suit, complete with mask, was tracked over the top during post-production. Though it's clear that Warner Brothers was going all in on this $200 million tentpole, it would have been much, much smarter to allow the director to simply give Hal a basic practical suit and mask which could then be embellished with VFX. Instead, there's a distractingly plasticky look to Hal's suit, especially the mask, that looks, uh, well, just hideous. Number 5. No Guns for the Angels 
Charlie's Angels. So in addition to being one of the film's three stars, Drew Barrymore was also a producer on the 2000 blockbuster adaptation of Charlie's Angels, having acquired the movie rights to the property years earlier. This gave Barrymore major creative control over the film, and one of her primary mandates was that the Angels never fire guns throughout. Now, it was an odd choice given that the original TV show had regularly featured the trio operating firearms, and yet Barrymore preferred to have them triumph through their martial arts abilities and tech skills. As creative impositions go, it's at least somewhat admirable from a moral perspective, even if the no guns rule probably felt like a rather extreme restriction to the screenwriters and was totally ignored in the reboot. Number 4. None of Jimi Hendrix's music could be used. Jimi, all is by my side. 2013's Jimi Hendrix biopic Jimmy All Is By My Side came and went without much of a peep despite starring a perfectly cast Andre 3000 in the title role, in large part because the film didn't include any music written by Hendrix. The filmmakers were unable to secure Hendrix's songs from his estate for use in the film, forcing writer-director John Ridley to alter the scope of his movie, focusing it instead in Hendrix's early years as he rose to prominence. And so we never see Hendrix play any of his most beloved songs, instead largely playing covers of other people's songs that he was known to have performed in the mid to late 1960s. It seems like a movie-breaking restriction, really, and though the end result is still an interesting experiment topped by a fantastic performance from Andre 3000, it is absolutely missing the undeniable kick and pizzazz that Hendrix's music would have given it. As such, Jimmy All Is By My Side fascinatingly underlines the tension inherent in making any musical biopic, and why so many of them end up as sanitized, estate-endorsed nonsense. Number 3. The novel's religious critique had to be heavily softened. The Golden Compass 2007's big-screen adaptation of Philip Pullman's Northern Lights was one of the most anticipated blockbusters of the 2000s, given the richness of the source material and the fact that, with a $170 million budget, New Line Cinema was clearly fashioning it as their new Lord of the Rings-esque fantasy franchise. However, The Golden Compass's production was far from smooth, as the writer-director frequently clashed with both producers and the studio, who wanted to ensure the film would be a palatable blockbuster for lucrative family audiences. This flew somewhat in the face of the novel's darker elements, including its noted critique of dogmatic organized religion embodied by the malevolent church outfit known as the Magisterium. By executive mandate, the director was forced to heavily dilute this critique to the point that it largely flew over the heads of both younger viewers and religious audiences alike. It was clearly a cynical calculation on part of New Line, who didn't want to risk turning away Christians as they represented a major slice of the box office pie. It did little to help, though, as The Golden Compass went on to receive wildly mixed reviews and massively underperformed at the box office, killing a potential franchise before it ever got started. Number 2. All the main cast members had to be British Harry Potter it's not all that surprising that Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling exerted an enormous amount of creative control over Warner Brothers' is, 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 is movie series, yet one of her most unexpected stipulations pertained to the nationality of the main cast. Rowling insisted that the ensemble be made up of British actors, and was firmly opposed to any Americans being cast in an attempt to preserve the distinct Britishness of her stories. This led to Robin Williams being turned down for the roles of both Hagrid and Professor Lupin, and the rule was strict enough that even though American director Chris Columbus's daughter Eleanor was allowed to play a small role in the form of Susan Bones, she wasn't allowed to speak in the movie due to being American. Though there are a few other fudgings of this apparent rule throughout the series, such as Irish actors being hired, for the most part Rowling held firm over the course of the eight Potter movies. And number one, the rules of the Dogma 95 Manifesto, Festen. Thomas Vinterberg's acclaimed 1998 black comedy Festen was the first entry into the Danish Dogma 95 cinematic movement, started by Vinterberg and fellow Dane filmmaker Lars von Trier. The pair created an artistic manifesto, effectively a checklist of 10 rules for films made under the Dogma 95 banner, in an attempt to create movies that deferred to a story and character over special effects. The rules were as follows. 1. Location shooting only with no additional props. 2. No extra diegetic sound. 3. Handheld camera work only. 4. Shot in color with no additional lighting, 5. No VFX or camera filters, 6. No superficial actions such as murder, 7. No temporal and geographical alienation, 8. No genre movies, 9. It must be projected in 35mm Academy format, and 10. The director goes uncredited. Vinderberg's Festin was the first film produced under these constraints, and though the director later admitted to bringing in an outside prop for lighting purposes, in turn breaking two rules at once, shock horror, for the most part he adhered rigidly to the agreed regulations. And truly, Festin is a technically stripped back film film free of typical cinematic affectations. It was shot on a Sony Handycam with regular mini-DV cassettes and without any sort of post-produced sound. Festen went on to receive rave reviews from critics and won the jury prize at the 1998 Cannes Film Festival. Despite Vinterberg being uncredited, it also helped establish his fledgling international career as a filmmaker.
And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 insane rules that movies weren't allowed to break. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming outside of work, and it'd be great to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself well, my friend, with love and respect, because you deserve all of the best things in life, and do not let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, all right? You're a massive ledge, and we need to go out there and utterly smash it today. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon.